Okay, everybody knows, common sense, that if a person needs a medicine, or if a person needs certain compounds, chemical compounds, biological compounds, you have to ingest them, you have to eat them. But health is not determined by one's access to these minerals and these medications and these compounds. Health is determined by the body's ability to absorb it. Some people, you know, you can go to the store, you can buy a medicine that costs $100, you can buy a generic brand that costs $4. Now, of course, nowadays the generic and the original are actually the same thing, but you can get cheap drugs. Same, it's made from the same exact chemicals. But they go in and they go out. What makes a drug effective is not that you take it, but that your body breaks it down. And one of the most painful illnesses, a man told me, my father eats three meals a day and he's dying from hunger. Because he has a metabolic illness, you understand? He has a digestive problem. He eats food, but his body does not process it, which is a terrible, terrible condition. So eating is not enough. The food we eat needs to be processed, broken down and digested. As the Rebbe so often says from the expression from the Chazal, Nasadam ubasar kibisari, the food you eat is broken down and becomes your blood and your flesh. Your blood and flesh becomes your food and you eat, right? When a person eats and properly digests food, the food is changed irreparably and the person is changed, the food becomes the person, it becomes inseparable, it becomes one, one continuum, one circle, it becomes inseparable. And this is another part of Chassidus, another whole story in Chassidus. And this is where the Alter Rebbe comes in. The Baal Shem Tev gave us the precious stone which lies at the base of the king's crown. The Alter Rebbe was the chemist who figured out how to help us metabolize it, digest it. That it should stay, you understand? That it should become a part of us. There's an expression that the previous Rebbe uses very often, and the Rebbe repeats it even more often, in Yiddish. The Baal Shem Tov had gewissen, as yet the daf din in the Mebishten, und der Alter Rebbe had bewiesen wie er soll. This is Yiddish. Which means, the Baal Shem Tov taught that every Jew can and must serve God. But the Alter Rebbe provided the method, taught how. <coughs> Chassidus, Chassidus is a ma it really is, Chassidus is magic. Chassidus is magic. I, I, magic is a weird word, it sounds almost childish. But if you have a better word, I'll use it. Chassidus works. Nobody knows why, nobody knows how, but it works. Chassidus works, look, look at the world. I was driving, where was I driving? Oh, I met Rabbi uh, Shays Taub this morning in Misrifke. So he was telling me how everybody in the five towns is into Chassidus. <laughs> so we had a conversation. You know, in, in the modern Orthodox world, everyone's into Chassidus. Why? Because it works. It's not intellectual. It's not intellectual at all. It's pure emotion. So what is the attraction? What is the attraction? It touches. You know that it's right. You don't know why. But you know that it's right. Whatever Chassidus is, works. You can't explain how, you can't explain why. It sometimes looks kind of funny. But Hasidus is around for almost 300 years. Hasidus and Hasidim are a very big success. And I'm not saying this for political purposes. I'm not saying this to score points. I'm saying this is the factual truth. So many Jews today, their whole relationship with Hashem and their entire Jewish identity in one way or another can be traced in the Baal Shem Tev. One of the great Hasidic masters, not a Chabad Rebbe, one of the great Hasidic masters, not a Chabad Hasidic master said, in Yiddish, as vu in der Welt, ayid vet ob my say to this chuvah, be is Mashiach vet kumen, 
is a dangdam bal shem tov. That any place in the world, at any point till Mashiach comes, if any Jew is aroused to do tshuva, the credit for that arousal belongs to the bal shem tov. The bal shem tov gave the world something very real. It's something that's very intangible. It's hard. That's why Chassidus is 288 years old and people still don't know what it is. It's mysterious because you cannot articulate it in logical language because it's not about logic. It's about something altogether different. It's something, it's, it's true spirituality. It's soul. It's neshama. But it has to work practically. You know, this African-American Major General in the United States Army put on film for the first time. Said Shema Yisrael for the first time, he cried. You know what he doesn't know? You know what he didn't know? What well, we know? What do we know? What do we know? Anybody know? What do we know? What do we know? You get used to it. <laughs> you get used to it. You can say Shema Yisrael at the Shem of the the Shem and not give it a second thought. You know the first time your Nisham has moved. But not necessarily the second time, and certainly not the third time, right? That's what we know. And this is the other dimension. Chassidus is not lightning in a bottle. It is lightning in a bottle, but it's not only lightning in a bottle. Chassidus meets a Jew on a street corner and asks him if he's a Jew, and he puts film on him and leaves a mark on that person that's going to last a lifetime. There's no doubt about it. But Chassidus has another dimension. And the other dimension of Hasidus is living like Hasidus. It's the way of life of Hasidus. And the way of life of Hasidus has to do with the sustainability of Hasidus. You're not a Hasid for a weekend, you know. You're not a Hasid for the first six months after you do tshuva. You're a Hasid for the duration of your life. This is a whole different story. This is not only the power of the neshama being triggered by some very, very magical, very miraculous event that a person experiences once in his lifetime or twice in his lifetime. This is sustained Hasidus. This is Hasidus every day. This is Hasidus as a way of life. And this is where the Talmidim of the Baal Shem Tev come in. The various disciples of the Baal Shem Tev. We're Chabad. We're Talmidim of the Alter Rebbe. We're Talmidim of the Rebbe, our Rebbe. And they give us their derech. Every Hasidic movement, all of them, and the great Gedeliat, the great tzaddikim of Hasidus of yesteryear, who created different approaches, different techniques, different styles, different priorities, different emphases, they were all after the same thing. Whether you're a Russian Hasid, or a Galician Hasid, or you're a Hungarian Hasid, or you're a Romanian Hasid, different kinds of Hasidus, and the different Hasidic groups reflect the societies, the cultures in which they lived, they were all after the same thing. To create packaging, to create a wrap around the Evan types of Kesar Amelach, the precious stone, which is at the base of the king's crown, not to cover it over, but to make it sustainable. To be a chassid every day. And that's harder. It's hard. It's the, the idea that you can have a moment where your neshama is triggered and you're ready to change everything in your life. We, if we don't know it personally, we can relate to it. But that lasts how long? Three months? Six months? Doesn't last forever. The sustainable chassid is a whole nother business. It's a whole nother endeavor, exercise. To live as a chassid every day is very, very different than having a magical chassidic moment. And this is what the chassidic rebbe who came after the Magid, and after the Dalta Rebbe and his contemporaries, this was their role, to create packaging, to take the, the pill of Hasidus, to take the Evan Tevsh of Echesed HaMelech of Hasidus, and mix it into the food, however you have to do it, that Hasidim should eat it, and they should be not transformed for a moment in some extreme way, but they should become Hasidim as a way of life. And every derech has its approach. In, in Hungarian Hasidus, it was all about frumkeit. In Galician Hasidus, it was all about joy and emotion. And never <laughs> in Russia, what are you going to do in Russia? Yeah? It's all about the alcohol and the brain. I, I, I'm not entirely serious when I say that, but I'm actually more serious than you think. Because Russians and alcohol, what can I say? They have different, 
their blood constitution is different. Um, the different Hasidic movements and the different Hasidic Rebbe's who created all these different approaches, they were all doing the same thing. They were giving sustainable Hasidus to their Hasidim. Each country, each community in its own way. I am a Kronheitzer, born and bred, more or less. <laughs> when I was a child, I davened in Aymahivim, Carol and Schenectady. The Rebbe didn't want us davening in 770. The Rebbe said, I have a minion without me. I don't need you for a minion. The Rebbe wanted us to keep the Shechunah, that the shul shouldn't fall because the people were running away from this neighborhood like it was a plague. So we davened locally. I saw a table of 20 men. Every one of them had a tattoo on his left arm. I saw them in the mikveh. They were all Hungarians, all survivors. And uh, I, I, I was too young to understand why they were so nervous and angry and agitated and hated kids, even though they had kids of their own. Now I understand. These were survivors. These were people who during the Holocaust were teenagers. And their emotional well-being was destroyed. They were more mental cases. They were really crazy. But they got married and they built families and they had children. And their children were, Amer the children were healthier than they were. I'm sure they gave over some of the, you know, they talk about fifth generation Holocaust survivors. Because it, goes, it takes a long time to get all those, that trauma out. And this is just something I love to say because I witnessed this. All of these Hungarian Jews were clean shaven. They were clean shaven. They didn't wear bekishes. They wore short jackets. And they wore gatlach. They were, came from Hasidic homes. But they went through the war. They came out of the war. They were from, which was in itself a miracle. But they were not overly from. Their children went to yeshivas. And their children grew beards. The children had pious, you understand? So when the oldest son got married, the son put on a stramo, and the father put on a bekeshe. When the second son got married, the father let his beard grow a little bit. When the third son got married, he had to grow a little more. When his youngest son got married, the father bought himself a stramo. You understand? These were hidden, whose lives were so destroyed, and they were their children who didn't have their experience. We're bringing them back. I, I saw this. So it, it, was, it was, I was too young. When I saw it, I didn't appreciate it. When I think about it, I, it's, it's very moving to me. So these out the Ungarish Yidin, in the front room of Raima Hidin, there was a box of cake. Now, cake and children means the box is empty. That box of cake was there till at a Pesach. Not for lack of trying. The cake was literally hard as rock. They bought cake at the Pesach. Every morning, these chevre, they all worked in the diamond district. In those days, the Frum Jew could make a living cutting stones. And a lot of Hamish Yid made a living uh, for the seventh street. There was all the Ungerish and There were a lot of Lubavitches over there also. Um, they would daven, I don't know, 27, 17 minutes. They knew how to read Hungarian. Somehow the script goes faster. Then they went into the next room. But they would fill up shot glasses. Seven, eight guys. They put the cake out, no one ever touched the cake. They would down their shot glasses and they would scream at each other. The cake went back in the box, put it away. As soon as the cake was done, they'd buy more. <laughs> but Adam Pesach, the cake went into the fire and after Pesach, they bought a new box. Now, until Shuas, the kids could steal the cake. Without the Shuas, there was nothing to eat. It was impossible to chew it. And I, I'm watching these old Jews and I'm a, a little boy scream at each other. Boy, they were so nervous. <laughs> What are they screaming about? Someone told the story. About who? It doesn't matter who. The Chayzim and Libli, the big tzaddikim. One guy told the story, and the other guy told him, you know what you're talking about, that story never happened. Third of them, no, it did happen, but it didn't happen this way. And to converse like normal people was not in the realm of possibility. <clears throat> so this was their daily argument. They went into the next room, some guy told the story, they screamed at each other, and they went to work. Now, <laughs> now I was little, I, I, I didn't even understand that people screaming at each other was wrong. I just thought that people they talked to each other. They were always nervous. We were kids in Reh They had Shalashidas. We would steal the chalas. Don't ask. Don't ask. It was really, really bad. Because they would, they, would, they would get so upset. 
we didn't understand how, why they were this nervous. You understand? If we had known how nervous they were, maybe, maybe, we would have been a little kinder. But it was us, the kids, and the whole Hungarian Jews was fire and kerosene. But we grew up together. Um, and I think now about it. These were Yidden, who in their childhood, their adolescence, lived in Shtetelach in Hungary, and every day, Midgang and Ishil, and they daven, and after they daven, you know, they, have a, they never say Tachan on these people, you know that. They have a list of Tzadikim, for literally every day of the year. By the way, for this, even the Lubavitcher Rebbe is holy enough, they never say Tachan. So every single day, there's a Tzadik's yard site, and there's a story. You tell a story, the other guy, no, you got it wrong, that story didn't happen, but this Tzadik, no, you got it wrong, and they would, whoop, whoop, whoop. These people, when they were little, before the war, watch their fathers do this. But I have a sneaking suspicion that their fathers didn't scream at each other, you understand? They talked to each other a little more civilly. They were not traumatized by life. And this is what they took. And this is what they did. They came to this country, Tzabrochen and Menchen, Be'erim and broken Jews, and they affiliated. You know, some went to Satmer, a lot of them were going to Skver. When they ever had a real problem, they went to Lubavitch. Otherwise, Lubavitch was no good. But the Hasidic tradition that they practiced was the one they saw in their childhood. And it was about telling stories. And that's what they did. They would tell stories. But you couldn't get through. In the of you never got through a story because somebody was going to tell you how wrong you were. What I found interesting was why bother? You know, why? But every day someone told the story and everybody else screamed at him and they never figured out the trick. Just keep your mouth shut. No one's going to scream at you. This was, this is, chassidus. Those stories that they said over the hard cake and the schnapps that they drank was chassidus. What does that mean? When they told these stories and when they screamed and shouted at each other and they went off to work, somehow, in that very simple exercise, they were getting in touch with their soul, with their neshama. Now it sounds simplistic, but it's about the warmth of Hasidus, it's about the joy of Hasidus, and it's about the, the faith at, at the base of Hasidus and Muna. Right? Hasidus wants God to be simple. Right? What's the difference between a Hasid and a non Hasid? A non Hasid, if he's from, has an answer to a question. And a Hasid, doesn't have the question in the first place. That's what it's about. Chassidus teaches us God is real. End of conversation. Everything else, mehechatese. It's not that important. And the, the, the lifestyle of Chassidus breeds this, it engenders this, it develops this, it cultivates it, it inspires it. So these old Yidn who I saw as a child, and I have to tell you, they made a very big impression on me. They really did. <laughs> Like I said, I grew up thinking that it's, it's normal for old people to scream at each other, but they made a huge impression on me. I remember these people well. I remember when they left the neighborhood. One by one, they ran to Borough Park. And how disappointed we were. And they stopped screaming at each other. There was no chalas to steal, because as soon as Lubav took over the shoulder, there was no Moshe Lajidis. <laughs> but they left a mark on me and my brother and many other children. We saw a form of chasir, it's not ours, it's not Chabad. But it worked. Alta Tzabrach and the Yidin, old broken Jews got together every day and told stories. And however the stories came out, and however they navigated and negotiated the truth or falsehood of the stories, these, these stories, this little experience was a moment of strengthening Jewish faith. It, it, in, in them, it fortified the fire, the heart, the warmth, the neshama, that is Hasidus, and, and the world mattered, mattered a little less. This is an example. And all over the Hasidic world, there are examples for this. In every Hasidic culture, in every Hasidic community, if it's a Hasidus, if it, in other words, if it has integrity, if it has a soul, every community has different traditions, different customs. Those customs are very important. Because those customs, those minhagim, those traditions are the, are the they're, they're, they're the packaging, they're the process 
by which the Eben Teshub Kesar HaMelech is digested, where this precious, the, the precious stone, which is the base of the king's crown, is processed and internalized in people. And we're Chabad. We're Chabad. We're followers of the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe was born in Russia. The Baal Shem Tev cut his hair. The Baal Shem Tev cut his hair as a three-year-old. But the Baal Shem Tev gave strict instructions that the Alter Rebbe was not even to know his name. The Baal Shem Tev did not want the Alter Rebbe to know who he was. The Baal Shem Tev said to his successor, the Baal Shem Tev said to the Holy Magid, quote, in Yiddish he spoke, Ichob gahat mesiras nefesh, as er zomich nish kenin, er is dying. The Alter Rebbe said to the Magid, I had mesiras, the Baal Shem Tev said, to the Magid, I had Mesiris Nefesh that he should not know me because he's yours. And then the Bashanta told the Magid, but he has to come on his own. So the Altareb was raised without Chasidis. Altareb was raised on Chasidis. Altareb was a prodigy, he was an unbelievable genius. He came to the Magid at the age of 18 and a half or 19 and a half, depending on the, which version of history, which text you follow. He was very young. But at that age, Altareb was already married with a child, he had one daughter. And he was a genius. He was a genius of geniuses. The Alter Rebbe had a following. As a teenager, Alter Rebbe had a following. And his disciples, his students were themselves big Lomdim, big Goinim, big Tamidech Chachamim. And the Alter Rebbe wandered out into the world. Long story with a lot of details. And he ended up in the Masjid Magid's shul. And after staying and going and coming back and deciding to stay, he made an appointment to see the Magid. The al Rebbe made an appointment to go into the Holy Magid. And when he came into the Magid, who was his Rebbe, the al Rebbe said to the Mizitra Magid, I have two issues, two problems in my life. Problem number one, in my entire life I have never worked hard. The al Rebbe said, he was an 18 year, 18 year old man, in my entire life, I have never ever worked hard at anything. Anything I try comes easy. I master Tadish Shabbat and Tadish Shabbat Peh, Nigla and Nister. I know it all and it was all easy. And the Alter Rebbe said that the Alter Rebbe said that the Gemara says Al If a person is successful but the success did not come through effort, then it's not real success. And the al Rebbe felt like he was somehow deficient because in his entire life he never struggled. That's number one. And number two, the al Rebbe said to the Holy Magad, I never had a Rebbe, I never had a teacher. Nobody could teach me, I'm smarter than everybody. And when the al Rebbe presented these two issues to the Mizitra Magad, the Mizitra Magad told the al Rebbe, I want you to know, I know all about you. The Baal Shem Tev told me about you many years ago. And he told me that I have to wait for you to come on your own. And the Mizitra Magid told the Alter Rebbe who he was. The Mizitra Magid told the Alter Rebbe what his neshama was and why he was born and what his mission was. And he reassured him. He says, you feel like you haven't worked hard enough in your life? Well, guess what? <laughs> your life's going to be miserable. You're going to work incredibly hard. So don't complain about your youthful uh, ease. He said to him, Tainas dir yegeb mgevore bematona. Taylor was given to us a gift because you have a very difficult mandate. And the mandate that the Mizitra Magid gave the Alter Rebbe was to create a packaging for Hasidus which changes the Rebbe Chassid relationship. This is Chabad. The Mizitra Magid told the Alter Rebbe that his purpose, the, the, the expression in Hebrew is to create a Hasidus that is premiistic, that you could internalize. And what it means basically, to create a Hasidus where the Chassid Rebbe relationship is not about the Chassid inspiring, the Rebbe inspiring the Chassid, but the Chassid Rebbe relationship is about the Rebbe teaching the Chassid how to self inspire. And that's what sets Chabad apart. I'm, I'm going to repeat myself a second time. When the, the Alter Rebbe was given a mission by his Rebbe in the name of the Holy Baal Shem Tev, that his role was to create a Hasidus that's called Pneumius, which means that the Rebbe Chassid relationship is not that the Rebbe gives direct inspiration to the Chassid, and the Chassid's Hasidus comes straight from the Rebbe, 
But that the Rebbe, instead of being one who inspires, becomes one who teaches. And the Chassid takes the lessons that he learns from his Rebbe, and he inspires himself. This is Chabad. Chabad Chassidus is the Alter Rebbe's creation. Is another packaging. It's what it is. It's another packaging for the same truth, which we call the Evan Tevshe Bekesar Amelach, the precious stone, which is the base of the king's crown. And every Chassidus you visit, if it's real, if there's real Chassidus in the world, and there's, I'm, I'm imagining there are places where there is, they're all after the same thing the Shoma, the soul, the fire inside. Chabad is unique in the Chassid Rebbe relationship. The Chassid Rebbe relationship is the Chassid comes to his Rebbe for the Rebbe to instruct him and to teach him. And the Chassid does the work for himself. Which explains us, Lubavitches. And we're Knappa Chabadnikis, let's not be kid ourselves. We're, they were bigger Chabadnikis in earlier generations than we are. But certain absolute truths of Lubavitch still hold true. And I'll put it to you in these words. Most, I'll tell you a story, okay? Stories are wonderful, right? Stories are wonderful. Stories are wonderful. I heard a story from Nagera Chusid at a Upsharen. I heard a story from Nagera Chusid. It's an old story from Nagera Rebis. Ger, Chasidis Gur, was a very, very, it still is, a gigantic Chasidis. The first Ger Rebbe was the Chadush Arim. He was a Talmud of the Kotzkin. He had hundreds of thousands of Chasidim. The second Gerer Rebbe was his, not his son, but his grandson, the Svas Emes. He had a couple hundred thousand more. Svas Emes' son was the Imre Emes, of Amartcha, who passed away in Israel in 1948. It was three generations. And between now, then and now, there were three brothers in succession, Rebbe's. And the current Rebbe is, the, is the, so I guess you can call him the fifth generation. He's a, a son of the Reb Simcha Bunim, of the Leif Simcha. Chassidus Gerer was always a very big Chassidus. And on a Yom Tif, on a Pesach, a Shu, as a Sukkot, you had 40,000 guests. 40,000 guests. Crown Heights never had 10,000. Seriously. 40,000 guests. That's an enormous number of visitors. So Ged, which was a suburb of Varsha, had big hotels, or whatever they were. They charged money for a service. <laughs> how much they charged, how good the service was, but people need a place to put their head and eat food. And on every Yom Tif, tens of thousands of Hasidim came to the Gerer the Rebbe in Ger, outside Varsha. Now every Jew makes a living, right? Some Jews build, some Jews write, some Jews sing, and some Jews parasite, you know? <laughs> they, they see other people's successes and they borrow it. In other words, well, how do I say it nicely? Y you know what I mean, right? Some Jews make a living by borrowing what other people have for an indefinite period of time. So if you were a chassid of the Ger Rebbe and you came to Ger, you were worried about your wallet. Especially if your wallet was full of money. Rich, there were many wealthy chassidim in Ger. So the Ger Rebbe, this story happened by the Sfasemis, by the second Ger Rebbe. The Ger Rebbe had a safe in her home. And even the Ganovim would not go into her house to steal. As they just gaze. And when you came to Ger and you brought with yourself wealth, whether it was money or it was diamonds or it was... Um, notes of value, you would go into the Gerard Ebbetson, you would count it, she would collect it, she'd put it in a little box or a little envelope, and she would give you a receipt. When you were going home, you would come back to the Gerard Ebbetson, you would give her the receipt, and you would collect your wealth. And that's how the Hasidim of Means were not afraid to visit the Gerard Ebbetson because they knew they were going to go home with their pants and what was in their pants. Every Yom Tif, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Pesach, Shuis, maybe Hanukkah too, was an old Yidl, a hunchback, who looked like a Nebuch, would show up in Ger, and go into the Ger at Ebbetson and hand her a wallet. The wallet was older than he was. It was old and battered. The Ger at Ebbetson looked at this man and understood that this was a schlepper, this was a beggar, it's another man, who had 10 cents in his wallet. She never even opened the wallet. She put the wallet in the safe and gave him a receipt for one wallet. Anyway, one yomtif, the wallet disappeared. She couldn't find it. So she says to herself, how much money could this man possibly have had in his wallet? 
So he, she gave him from her own money 15 zlotas. 15, it was a lot of money. 15 zlotas was money. And she was certain that this guy is getting far more than he lost. He takes the 15 zlotas, looks at the zlot, looks at the money, looks at the Rebetzin, thinks, thank you, and leaves. And the wallet turns up. And there's 300 zlotas in the wallet. The man had a lot of money. Had a lot of money. I don't know if he was rich, but he had a lot of money. So the Gera Rebetzin runs into her husband and tells us a strange story. A man comes every yomtif, brings me an old battered wallet. I never even counted the contents. The wallet disappeared. I gave him 15 zlotas. There's 300 zlotas in the wallet. So he tells his wife that Gera Rebbe, next yomtif will come. You'll give him back the wallet. So the next yomtif comes and this old man comes with a new old wallet. Again, uh, it's a shmet that it wasn't new, it was old. So he comes in with this new old wallet and he wants to deposit to the get at Ebbets and says, wait, wait, wait a minute. You know, I found your wallet. She says, okay. He says, I looked inside the wallet. And he says, okay, there were 300 zlotas. I gave you 15 zlotas. And you didn't say boo. So this man says to the Gere Rebetzin, Ich weiß, as a Rebbe davon gilt. I know that the Rebbe's always need money, not because they're going on vacation, but because they have a lot of responsibility. So whenever I come, I bring a wallet. There was an old Chabad Chassid who some of us knew. I don't know, maybe none of us knew, but he was in Rabbi Simpson. Rabbi al Simpson used to say that a Chassid comes to a Rebbe with three things. Bebutl, bebeitl, bebitl. Butl means a bottle. Beitl means a wallet. And bitl means service. In other words, you know you come to Rebbe, you bring money because the Rebbe has all kinds of public service needs. This Gere Chosid, every Yomtev came with a wallet full of cash to the Gere Rebbe. So when you gave back the 15 Zlotas, I figured the Rebbe needed the money. That's what the money was for. So I took the 15 Zlotas, the rest, this is the change. The Rebbe needs the money. She was so moved. Imagine a guy loses 300 Zlotas. She gives him back 15, it doesn't say boo, why? It's the Rebbe's money. She goes back into her husband and tells her husband what this man said. And the Gera Rebbe says, bring him into me. Now imagine, you have 40,000 guests for a Yom Tif. How much attention does every Chosid get from the Rebbe? How much? A handshake? 40,000 guests. That's five, seven, seventies packed to the rafters. Maybe six. It's so many people in a weekend. And this chosid gets a yechidus, the Gere Rebbe calls him in. And he tells him, the, the, the throw, the balabasta, the Rebbe told me what happened. And I want to reward you for this. I want to give you something in return. Ask me whatever you want and you got it. Ask me whatever you want. So this old chosid says to the Gere Rebbe, Baal des Paisich. Soon is Paisich. Paisich. Ich will... As Gant Pesach, so Lir Badin in the Reb. I want that this Pesach, I should serve the Reb. I should bring him his fish, I should bring him his soup, I should bring him his chicken, I should clean up his place. This was a So this, this Fasemus, the Machmatan, has he can't bet in If you ask me for millions, I would give you. And you want a week of service. This is the story. This is a Chabad story. You know why? Because it represents the uniqueness of the philosophy of Chabad. And I, God knows, God knows, I'm not trying to be better. I'm simply trying to explain. Chabad Hasidus is unique because the definition of a Chassid is one who gives, not one who takes. That's the real point. Every chassid comes to a Rebbe. And you're coming to a Rebbe because you need something from the Rebbe. And what you need from the Rebbe, to, to say the cliche for the 57th time, is the Evan Tevsh of Melech. You need that magic. You need chassidus. That chassidus is joy. That chassidus is faith. That chassidus is, is God. So you're coming to the Rebbe to shop, to acquire. The Alta Rebbe created a package of chassidus, which is ironic, which is interesting. You get chassidus by giving. 
You get chsidis by giving. This is the uniqueness of the derech of Chabad. Going back to the times of the Alter Rebbe, the, the Rebbe used to say it all the time. In the non-Chabad world, you say, Tzadik bemonose yichya al tikri yichya el yichaya. Which means, basically and roughly, you go to your Rebbe and the Rebbe charges up your batteries. In Chabad you say, Tzadik bemonose yichya means every Jew is a Tzadik. And no one is charging up your batteries for you, you have to charge up your own batteries. You go to the Rebbe for instruction. For teaching. And the inspiration, the Hasidus, comes from yourself. When the Rebbe became a Rebbe in 1951, Yitzvat, he spoke. And amongst the many things he said in that maiden Fabrengen, that initial Fabrengen was, this is Chabad. Do not think that you put me on this chair and I'm going to work and you're going to sit and eat the fruits of my labor. That's not what's going to happen. You put me on this chair, I'll do everything in my power. But everybody has a job to do because this is Chabad. That's what the Rebbe said in the verse Fabrengen. After the Rebbe finished saying the Maimech Sidis, Basi Lagani, the Rebbe made this short little speech. There's a tape of it. You can actually hear the Rebbe's own words where the Rebbe says, Mephalosich Nishtafen Rebbe. Chabad is not a Hasidus where the Rebbe does the work and we just bask in his glory. There's something for us to do. And this is... Does an emir. This is what we are. Chassidus, we, Lubavitchers, were raised on the philosophy of giving. That's really the truth. We were raised on the philosophy of giving. We were raised in the philosophy of figuring out what I could do as a servant of the Rebbe. And uh, I, I do my job by making speeches. I uh, might as well advertise myself. I have no shame. I'm a self, shameless self-promoter. If you don't know who I am, I'm inside chasidas.org. I'll be happy to give you my card. In, please check me out. Inside chasidas.org. I teach chasidas. At this point, to a lot of people, Baruch Hashem. Please visit my website. I'll keep you busy for a lifetime. I have a lot of classes. Um, everybody finds their niche. Because every chassid asks himself, what am I going to do to create my chassid? And here's the truth of the matter. Here's the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is, you know, there's a, there's a, a verse from the middle of the Rebbe, from the second Lubavitch Rebbe, who lived in a very different time, with a different kind of Rebbe, a different kind of chassidim. A chassid came into the middle of the Rebbe and told the middle of the Rebbe, the second Lubavitch Rebbe, that his chassidus isn't going. It's not working. The daven, it's daven tzachnish, that's leren tzachnish. Whatever I need to do is all... It's hiccuping. It's not going well. So the middle of the Rebbe said to this man in Yiddish, there's two v'yich to do what I do. As yich zeh, as medzich, gibich zich nish keneitze, hebech nitam etat When I see that I have no success with myself, I try to help somebody else. We, this generation, the whole, the post-Holocaust world, it's a new world, which requires a whole new approach to chassidus. The Rebbe, our Rebbe, created a chassidus of giving. He took kids, kids, boys and girls, American-born boys and girls, who never suffered in their lives, who were Americans, they knew how to waste time and have a good time and go on vacation. And he figured out a way to make them givers. And in giving to other people, they became chassidim. When you give, this is, this is the magic of the Rebbe. The Rebbe said a maimir, you know that? A couple of weeks before the stroke, the Rebbe gave out a maimir, which everybody knows and many people have. It's a very, very important maimir. That maimir talks about the relationship between the Chassid and the Rebbe. It talks a lot about a Munu. It talks a lot about Mashiach. But the highlight of the maimir, the point of that maimir is the words, V'yikhoilach. Likhoilecha means you want to be a chassid, give. You want to be a chassid, going to a rabbi and eating his cake, going to a rabbi and listening to his stories, going to a rabbi and being inspired by his emotion is nice. You want the chassid to, you want the to last? You want the chassid, the chassid to be stronger than the tests of the modern world? There's only one way. Chabad. And Chabad is not Chabad anymore. Chabad is 
Tefillin. Chabad is Kashrus. Chabad is Tarsa Mishpacha. Chabad is Mitzvahs. Chabad is every person gives. You know, when we, we, we I'm, I'm a teacher in yeshiva, but I remember this as a boy, and I know this now. Every once in a while, and it, once in a while, it's actually quite often, that one of the children decides that he's not sure there's a God. It's part of being an adolescent. It's all kinds of stuff, right? They, everyone's, one kid or another comes up with questions. And you have to be so careful. You can't make fun of them, and you can't say the wrong thing. It's very, very complicated when the kids have difficulties with anything, with faith, with religion, with mood. But more often than not, when a kid's not sure there's a God, he needs a hug. <laughs> he doesn't need a lecture in theology. He needs to be made to feel good. But the trick in Lubavitch for a kid with a problem with a Munah is take him on the time. Have him put film on somebody else. You know, there's kids in Lubavitch who go on the time every Friday. I'm sorry to tell you this. And they don't put film on themselves. They go out the street, they find, if, if another Jew puts on film, then that day they put it on. A kid told this to me. Now I'm not saying this because I'm proud of him. But when these children go out into the street and they have to explain God to other people, they find God themselves. When we have to be makad of somebody else, we are makad of ourselves. And this, I think, is not unique to Shluchim, it's not unique to Lubavitch. It's a lesson in life. In this country, in the United States of America, in the world in which we live, with all of its wealth, and with all of its confusion, and with all of its sadness, everybody knows this. You want to be happy? Give. You want God? Give. You want faith? Give. You want chassidus? You want to feel the warmth and the joy that our ancestors felt 150 years ago? Be a mashpia. You can't teach the whole world, you can teach the neighborhood. You can't teach the neighborhood, you can teach one person, two people, three people. Every person finds a way to give. And the giving is our chsidis. I remember when I was in yeshiva, so arts came. You know what arts is? The accreditation. All the yeshivas get college money from the government because they're accredited as, uh, as colleges. So we're teaching religious studies, but they, they're accredited and they give us money and they also give you credits if you want to go on to study a profession. So what you learn in yeshiva can count as credits to whatever degrees. It's complicated and always changing. But arts is a from organization, orthodox organization, which is really centered basically in Lakewood. And a lot of yeshivas are under arts. And every few years they come down to the yeshiva to re-accredit. So they, they look at the books and they talk to the boys. So they bring a Rosh Hashiva. They bring a Rosh Hashiva to Fahed the Bacharim. They don't bring a Levavich Rosh Hashiva. They bring a Rosh Hashiva who is antagonistic to see if the boys can learn. And this goes on in every Yeshiva. So there's, there's, there's meetings during this weekend. I was a kid. I was in 770. And they asked me to go sit in at a lunch. And the head of arts, whose name I remember at the moment, says to the boys, so at 20 years old, you went on Shlichus. And 20 years old, you left Crown Heights, you went to California, I, we, we were learning in a yeshiva, and you were busy being makad of others. When are you going to learn? So I, I told him what I thought. I said, you think the Rebbe sent us to California to be makad of somebody else? The Rebbe sent us to California to be makad of somebody else, but for every good we do for another person, we do five goods for ourselves. It makes us into a minch. It goes us up. And I can't, uh, his reaction. He, ah, I never thought of that. When you give to somebody else, the fact of the matter is, you understand Torah when. When you teach, right? You sit and you learn, you learn, you learn, you learn. The Rosh Hashiva doesn't show up one day and say, you know, give the shir today and you prepare. That's the only day you really, that's a fact of life. And this is a real truth about our time, and about our Rebbe, and about Chabad, and about Chasidis. A person who wants to feel closer to Hashem has to be makad of somebody else to the Ebishter. It's emes. It's true, and it's real. And this is Chabad. This is who we are. And this is the Alter Rebbe's contribution. You understand? The Alter Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tif, brought the, the magic into the world, and the Alter Rebbe created the, the lavush, the garment, the packaging that teaches us how to personalize it. And, and, and to be honest, I'm not just making a speech. This is something better to think about. 
Every Lubavitch wakes up in the morning and says, what am I going to do to be a chassid? What am I going to do to be a of another yid to be a chassid? And in being a of another yid, we're a of ourselves. In giving of ourselves to somebody else, we find the Eibish there, we find the Muna, we find Simcha, we find humility. And if we're Zeichel, we even find Yiddish Shemayim. So L'chaim V'lebracha, L'chaim Tehis Chayelo, it's the Baal Shem Tov's birthday, it's the Alter Rebbe's birthday. Hashem should inspire us, that we should do something, that's all. And one thing should lead to another mitzvah, get a mitzvah, one good deed, second deed, and so on and so forth. Okay, L'chaim, L'chaim V'lebracha.